We want to see as many saved before Jesus returns. Amen. Something very interesting the Lord had sh uh, shown me this morning as I was studying. I know that many of you have heard of the government mandate that was given in New York that a baby can be aborted one day before, before its birth. One day from the due date, it can be, it can be aborted. Governor Cuomo is the one who, in, who is, um, along with a lot of the liberals, have said that they can do that now. It's legal in New York. And I was sitting in my office this morning, and this scripture came to my mind. And if you can close that door too, close that door too. Oh, they have, I thought they already gone. Okay, Sunday school is dismissed. Bye. You kids behave, all of you, and I'm getting reports, and if you don't behave, I'm going to go tell your parents. And they bought, no. Praise the Lord. And I was in my office this morning. The Lord brought a scripture to my mind that says, The life is in the blood. So I did a little bit of research about babies that are in the womb. And do you know that the baby at three months produces eight quarts of blood? So they can't say there's no life in the baby. There's life in the blood. And I hope that God opens their eyes to see that before he pours out his judgment on that, that town. You, you know, New York has been hit very hard lately in the last few years. They haven't seen anything yet. And I say that right now, right on, right on live Facebook right now. New York, you better get ready. If you don't repent, you're going to see what God's going to do. The blood of those babies are crying out. The title of my message this morning is The Blood Applied. Now, I know that there's not too many messages today in many churches about the blood of Jesus. But the blood of Jesus is so vital to our Christianity. It's the core foundation of what we believe. You can turn the television on, and I'm telling you, you can listen to preacher after preacher, and they'll tell you your best life now. They'll tell you how to get rich. They'll tell you how to do many things. But very seldom will you hear a preacher preach about the blood. That blood that was shed on Calvary's cross, that life that was given on Calvary's cross, is just as powerful Today, as it was 2,000-something years ago. Thank you. That blood that was poured out on Calvary is the same blood today that saves, sanctifies, redeems, justifies. It's the same blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to turn with me, please, in the book of Exodus. And I'm going to use the Holman version, the H-O-C-B, I think it is. I keep getting that all mixed up, H-O-B-C, L-M-N-O-P, whatever it is. I know it's the Holman Christian something or other. H-C-S-B. Thank you, Robert. I could write that in my Bible. Exodus chapter 12. It's the story of the Passover. Many of you know about it. 
What was the Passover? Well, the Passover was, you remember when the children of Israel were in Egypt? And while they were in Egypt, over 400 years of slavery, there came a time when God called a man by a prophet named Moses. And he told Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver my people. He said, you will go to Pharaoh and you will tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And you know the story. He went several times and, of course, Pharaoh said no. And God sent a plague and God sent judgment and one thing after another. And then Pharaoh got a little upset and he said, well, you know what? We'll just kill all the firstborn of the Israelites. And that did it with God. So God told Moses, he says, I want you to tell your people of Israel, I want you to tell them to go into their home to slay a lamb, go through the, the process of the lamb sacrifice, but I want you to take some hyssop and dip it into the blood. And I want you to take that blood, Moses, and I want you to apply it to the doorpost and the lentil of the doorpost, not to the threshold. There's a reason for that. The reason for that is because a lot of the pagan deities, they would put blood on the threshold and people would walk on it for blessing. God knows what he's doing. You don't need to walk on the blood to get a blessing. Hallelujah. You need to have the blood applied for the blessing. That's the title of my message, The Blood Applied. And so Moses, being instructed by God, told his people, take the lamb, the offering, the sacrifice, take the hyssop, dip it in, and anoint the blood on the doorpost. In verse 7 he says, And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts on the upper doorpost of the house wherein they shall eat. And he says, when you do that, after you've eaten of the offering, there should be nothing left, he says. And look at verse 10, he says, and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. You must burn up every part of it and, and every part of it that does remain until morning. Next verse, please. Here is how you must eat it. Dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. Why is that? Because right after this Passover, right after this initiation of the judgment of God being initiated, the people would be set free. They had to be ready in a position to be set free. Some people don't get set free when they first get saved because they haven't prepared themselves. Hallelujah. You've got to prepare yourself just like they prepared themselves before they were getting ready to be delivered. There was a preparation. And verse 12 says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt. That's God saying that. Aren't you glad that he's not some high pie sky God? That he's right here and can move right here in New Bedford. He can move right in our city. He can move in our state. He can move in the United States. He can move all over the world if he chooses to. To set his people free. He says, I'll come down. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both men and beasts. And against the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood, hallelujah, shall be to you 
for a token or a symbol. Hallelujah. Verse 13. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see <laughs> Oh, get excited. When I see the blood I will pass over you. Ooh. Are you hearing me? He said, when I see the blood of the Lamb, when I see that blood, I will pass over. Over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt. He says, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Shall be to you for a memorial. Look at verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out now and take you a lamb according to your families. Kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that it is in the basin and strike the lentil, the two side posts, with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They had to stay in the place for the blood to be able to protect them. Well, isn't God omniscient? Isn't he all powerful? Can he protect them outside the house? That's not how God works. He says, you stay where the blood has been applied. And you stay in it until the judgment passes. God is telling us through this story as New Testament believers that you have no business going out where the blood will not cover you. You have no business going to places and being in places where the blood will not cover you. Hello? You cannot go to places that God's judgment is on. Because the blood will not cover you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. When God told Moses to strike the lentils in the doorposts, he told them to stay inside because when his judgment came, Anyone that was not inside, covered by the blood, that was a child of the firstborn child, firstborn cattle, everything, 
would die. So everybody that was in was saved. Everyone that was out was not. Why? Because the outside was experiencing God's judgment. Now watch this. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate. Because he took the judgment that was designed for those who would not stay in the blood. He took, come on somebody, he took the penalty. He suffered outside the gate in the realm of God's judgment, not for his own sin, but because of your sin and my sin. He suffered outside the gate. For what purpose? So that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was willing to step outside that place. That honorable place as the son of God. He was, he was willing to uh, s- s- you know, step aside and leave it there and say, okay, now I'm coming into your judgment, God, for your people. Because the wages of sin is death. The just punishment for sin was death. That's God's justice. And Jesus had to satisfy that justice. So he suffered outside. He suffered outside the gate for the purpose that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. I said to you that the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. If you want the life of Christ in you, it's in the blood. Stay inside the place that God has called salvation. Don't move away from the salvation that God has brought to you. Don't move outside the realm, hallelujah, of that sanctified place that God has called you to. The setting aside to be ye separate and come out of the world and touch not the unclean thing. He said, and I will receive you. Let everything be covered in your life by the blood. When you're afraid, do you plead the blood? Or do you go run to the psychologist (laughs) to help deal with your fear? Run to God. Say, God, cover my fear with your blood. Take it away. Help me, Lord. With your depression, whatever it may be, apply the blood. When you feel a demon attack coming against you and, you and Satan's coming against you and tempting you, oh, with a strong temptation. The Bible says no temptation that is common to man has come that God will not make a way for you to escape it. You know how you escape it? Apply the blood. The place where the blood is applied is the place where... There has been a death. Can't have the blood of the lamb without a lamb that has been slain. You can't apply the blood to your old life. Hello? You must die. So the blood can sanctify. That's why Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. What happens on a cross? There's shedding of blood. There's a death process. God says to you and to me that if you want the apply of the blood in your life, there's things that you must die to and be willing to die to and apply the blood to.
Now, I have a little different philosophy than some of the psychologists and some of the counselors. They want to build up people's esteem. I say nail it to the cross. Be the person God created you to be. You won't have no self-esteem problem at all. When God says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, take what he says. That should lift up your spirit. Never mind what somebody tells you. Somebody may tell you you're ugly or you're fat or you're skinny or you're bald or whatever it may be. And that doesn't make a hill of beans as long as you know what God has called you to be. God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't settle for anything less. Don't settle for any kind of relationship that treats you that way either. Hallelujah. Let the blood be applied. Let the blood be applied, I said. Let the blood be applied. There has to be a death. Has to be. And there has to be a remaining in. As you remain in Christ, don't wander out from the protection of the blood. Stay in that place of protection. Verse 13, he said, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, oh, glory, I'll pass over. When I see the blood, I'll pass over. When I see the blood. Do you understand? That when someone is bleeding, the first reaction is to go and help that person to stop bleeding. Someone you love, your daughter, your child, starts to bleed. You don't just sit there and say, well, we'll let her bleed out. No, you go and you try to help to stop the bleeding. Why? Because you love them. God did not stop the bleeding, not because he didn't love Jesus, but because he loved you. Think about that. God did not stop the bleeding of his son on that cross, because he loved you. And Jesus bled out on that cross for you. Every last drop came out of him. And then he cried, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost for you. Yet his heavenly father didn't stop it. For you. That should make you stay in the covering and the protection of the blood. Stay there. Stay in what God says the, there's life in the blood. Stay in that eternal life. Stay in that place that God has ordained for you. He hasn't ordained the bar rooms for you. He hasn't ordained dancing for you and shaking your body. God hasn't ordained that for you. He said, come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. But that only comes through relationship. That only comes through blood. That only comes through the sacrifice of the lamb. You can't have a relationship with the father without going through the lamb. I'll show you. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. According to the law, almost everything 
is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. None. Why do you think the Jews are planning the, the uh, Temple Institute in Israel is planning a rebuilding of the third temple? They have a bloodless religion now. And they need to go back to that. They need to go back to that. We don't need to go back to that. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you didn't have to go to temple and bring a lamb, an unblemished lamb, and you had to kill it, cut its throat, let all the blood drain out, and give it as an offering for your sin? Aren't you glad you don't have to do that anymore? Aren't you glad that Jesus did that for you? He gave of, him, of himself for you. For you. He did that for you. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. You and I can only go before God through the blood of Jesus. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's the blood applied, understand. By faith, received. So when your unsaved person comes and says they're talking to God, they are not. When the sinner comes before God and they're not saved and it's your boss or your co-worker or something, and they're not born again like the Bible says, and they have not applied the blood, they are not under that blood covenant with Jesus Christ, what does it say? That now we have boldness to go before the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. But if you're not in the blood of Jesus, you can't go to God. Do you understand why? Because God's justice has not been satisfied to them. They're still under judgment. They're, in other words, they're the ones that are outside. The blood is on the post. If they come inside, they're protected. But because they're on the outside, they're not protected. They need to come on. The inside. The blood has to be applied on the inside. And that's the only way that God can hear them. Now, God can hear the prayer of repentance. Why? Because the prayer of re repentance includes forgiveness. Right? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. When they come and ask for forgiveness... They're asked, what they're asking is, God, let your blood cover my sin. There are times we go through different things in our life and we go through the enemy trying to attack us. Can I tell you, this is one of the doctrines or one of the teachings that the devil laughs at because many churches don't preach the blood anymore. And he laughs because he has all kinds of fun with people that don't know how to apply the blood of Jesus in their life. He, he doesn't care. He, he loves that when a church doesn't know about the blood. He loves it when people don't understand the covenant of the blood. The enemy loves that because people go on living their life unprotected but you can be protected when you're inside in the blood that doesn't mean that things can't happen to you but even though those things that they do happen God still protects you amen be in the place of protection now from what I've read over the years, and this is me, okay? 
if I am home or I'm doing something and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I get a pounding headache. All of a sudden, right out of the blue. In deliverance ministry, when you read about deliverance, they'll tell you, when there's a strong presence of demons, it can bring on an instant headache. So when that happens to me, if I, if I feel an instant headache come on, I do this. Lord Jesus, I apply the blood on this headache right now, and I command it to leave this demonic attack in Jesus' name. You cannot come through the blood! And I'm telling you, every single time I've done that, that headache has disappeared instantly. Yeah, but pastor, what if it, I get one of those gradual headaches that come on and it comes on over a period of time? What do I do? Take an aspirin. Take a Tylenol. But when those things come, or when a temptation comes, go ahead. Steal that thing. Nobody's looking. Go ahead, take it. Steal it. Nobody's looking. Go ahead, take it. When that temptation comes, apply the blood. Lord, I apply the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to be a thief. I apply the blood of Jesus. And I can tell you this right now. There's a lot of people right now, today, that need to do that when they go to h and Block for their taxes. They need to plead the blood over lying, cheating, stealing. Oh, yeah, I gave $20,000 to the church. <laughs> Come on now. You can't apply the blood in an, unjust, in an unjust manner. You can't expect God to bless you with more if you're not a good steward with what you have. Come on. If you're a good steward with what you have, God will give you more. Praise God. Why? Because you're in that covenant relationship with him. I'm a joint heir with Christ. That's what the Bible says. A joint heir. Whatever he's going to inherit, I'm going to get. I got a mansion up in heaven. We're going to walk on streets of gold, Revelation says. But we're not going to walk on it like this. I'm walking on some streets of gold, man. Check me out. I'm on gold here now. Yes, sir. No. It's going to humble you. The thing that life so is so precious and so gone after, gold, we're going to be walking on it. Whew. The blood applied. You having difficulty in your life? Apply the blood. How do you do that? Lord, I am in blood covenant relationship with you. Lord, I need this. I'm your daughter. I'm your son. Isn't that something the Bible says you have sons and daughters, not he, she's? Sons and daughters, very plain, male, female. I have a need, God. I'm in covenant relationship with you. And what happens when you're in covenant relationship with God? I said, to much is given, much is required. I said also that for you to be a blessing to somebody else. Think about this. I have a relationship with God. Leisha has a, a relationship with God. Think about this now. And in her busy schedule, because she's always going everywhere, anywhere, okay, riding here, giving rides there, doing this, going there, but in her busy schedule, Louie and, you know, uh, food shopping and laundry and everything she does, yet she can be still enough to hear God. God. 
be reminded of a song, to be reminded of Latia, to send it. Why? How could she do that? Because she's in blood covenant. Latia is in blood covenant. Staying in the house where the blood's been applied. And guess what happens? That's what ministry is all about. It's not about the preacher getting up and preaching on sun, a Sunday or Monday or Wednesday. You get this message so that you can be encouraged about the things that you need to apply the blood to in your life so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. Do you understand that there are overweight Christians spiritually? That they have heard and heard and heard and heard and heard and heard and heard the word week after week, year after year, and they don't share or are moved by the Spirit like that anymore? When you can move in the spirit realm and, and you, can, you can listen to God and God say, go give that person $20. Or go pay for that person behind you's groceries. Or give that person, in, the one behind you, the coffee and donut or whatever they want. Have, pay for their coffee and donut. All because you're in covenant relationship. But some of you just go, I wouldn't do that. Well, guess what? You have not because you... You don't give. If you're a giver, God will give. Press down, shaking together, running over. Hello? If you're faithful to his word, what he says in his word, you are in covenant agreement. But once you break that covenant, now, I'm going to talk about this for a moment because Joe's in the banking business. And it seems like every once in a while I pick on Joe, but I'm not picking on him. Okay? But Joe's in the banking business. But he does loans. Okay? And he has to, he has to collect all of this information and then when the loan is approved, they have a pipe meeting, I guess, and they, they get together, they discuss the loan and uh, the percentages of payback and all of that stuff, and they come up with the conclusion that it's safe for the bank to make that particular loan in that investment. But they don't just give the person the loan. The person has to come in and make a covenant agreement. He is signing his name. And that contract does not go into effect until that person signs on the dotted line. What are they signing? A promissory note. They're promising that by you doing what you're doing, the bank, I will do my part. And the requirements that are stipulated in the contract agreement. In the contract agreement. So what happens if you default? Well, Joe, you lose everything within that contract. Hello? Hello? You can lose everything if you move out of that contract. Don't move out of this contract that you made with God. Oh, you made a contract with him. You're a slave. Say, I'm a slave. You know, some people didn't say it. I'm a slave. Say it again, nice and loud. I'm a, I'm a slave. You know what a slave is? A slave has no rights. If you look back and you study the slaves, when a slave, when a slave master said something, you didn't argue with him. You didn't argue with him. Right? When he said something, you said, yes, master. You did it. Otherwise, you had to suffer the consequences. Well, when we come to Jesus, right, we, we accept him as our Lord and 
See, you don't hear too much about the master part anymore. Oh, just accept him as Lord. No, you can't. You can't dissect a la carte God. <laughs> oh, I like this part about it, and I like this part about it. Well, I'm not going to deal with that part. You can't do that with God. Hello? You've got to obey. You're a slave. Not by force. You volunteered. I know but probably Robert or Rebecca, because they were in the service. Rebecca, come here, I need you. You you're gonna be, huh? Yeah, okay, that's okay. I can stay far enough away. Uh, I'm covered. I'm covered. <laughs> I'm covered. Okay, you can stand right there. Okay. Now, she was in the Air Force. And I'm sure that when she was in the Air Force, she had her little uniform on and her little hat, you know, looking pretty as ever. You know, I saw that little pretty picture of you when you were 16. She hasn't changed much. And I'm sure that when you went through basic training that your sergeant or whatever came up to you and said, um, uh, Rebecca, if you don't mind, could you, could you do 25 push-ups for me, please? I'd really appreciate it. Do you think that the officer did that? <laughs> Rebecca, get down and give me 25 right now. Get down. What's the matter with you, you stupid? I gave you an order. Get down there. I'll kill you. I know you can't get down. You've been 25. <laughs> Why? Because she enlisted. She signed it, a contract. Did you ever back talk him? <laughs> Why not? I was too afraid to. Why? You, what was the punishment? You can be punished. Discipline, do punishment. Or and, doesn't the whole, and doesn't the whole company get punished sometimes? If you disobey, so not only do you get the wrath of him, you get the wrath of all your other peers. She made a contract agreement, though. She signed her name. So everybody goes in the army. I want to be a Marine. <laughs> I'm going to be an I'm going to be a nice outfit man. Girls are going to fall, flock all over me. Some of you would be wet in your pants if you went into the Marine Corps. All these tough guys, you know, they think they're tough. I read stories, man, guys, I heard stories where, where they were out on, on maneuvers and they were in the tents and this guy was next to this other guy and they were 18 years old and he says, man, I can't take this anymore. He got up and he went up to the side. You can go sit down. He said, I, I can't take this anymore. He goes up to the side and he says, Sarge, I need to talk to you. He says, what are you doing out of your tent, boy? What do you want? He said, I can't sleep. That boy next to me, he's crying for his mama. He said, can, can, send him somewhere else. He said, no, I'm going to make a man out of him. You're in God's army. You're, 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 you've enlisted in this thing. This, 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 ain't a, uh, this ain't a club. Christianity ain't a club. It ain't something you join. You are enlisted in it. You signed your name on the contract. And it's in blood. It's binding. There's no escape clause. You're in it. And when God says to you, what do you think you're doing? Where are you going? <laughs> you can't do that in the army. You can't get out of your seat. If you're not up at 4 a.m. to have breakfast and you get there at 4.15, you don't get breakfast. Hello? Now, that's just the human side. What about God? We, we've got this wishy-washy complex about who God is. I could see some of you 
right now, I can picture you with the Israelites coming up, coming up against Jericho. And God said, okay, I want all of you to march around the city seven times. I want you all to march around the city of New Bedford seven times. I'm going to bring the stronghold of God down. After the first time, you say, okay, okay God, I think one time's enough. I'm talking about all the way from Sasquatch up there, walk all the way down Ashley Boulevard, all the way down by the forts, all the way back around, all the way up near Dartmouth, all the way back around, all the outskirts of New Bedford, walk it seven times. Some of you would have the philosophy, well, God, you can do it without that. But God told him, you do that. You do your part, I'll do my part. But don't expect me to do my part if you will not do your part. What's your part? To remain in the blood contract that you made with Jesus. To stay firm with Jesus. To listen to his voice. To follow after him. Apply the blood to the doorposts. Someone had told me, Pastor, the devil's after me. Well, welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. Why is he after you? There's, there's either two reasons he's after you. One, he wants to get you to sin. Or you're such a danger to his kingdom that he's going to try to stop you. Now, I'd rather have the devil after me because I'm doing something for God and it's threatening his kingdom. Rather than coming after me and trying to get me to do something against God against the word so that I can be happy for a day or maybe a season. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but only for a season. And we make all these promises with God. God, if you do this for me, if you do this for me and such and such for me, then I, I, I'll, I'll be able to do this, this, and this. Then God does that for you and guess what? You don't do this and this anymore. What happened? You think God takes that lightly? Read Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Be not rash with thy mouth. Silly man, silly woman. Don't make a vow before God. Don't be so rash to make a vow before God. Oh, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll obey. Well, what happened? Your boat was sinking, flooding up with water. Oh, God, if you get me out of this boat, God, if you, if you deliver me from this thing, and God, if you bring my sanity back, God, if you, if you just touch me, God, oh, God, I promise that I'll do this. I'll, what happened after God did all that? Because you're not staying in the covenant of the blood. Stay in the covenant of the blood. I want to stay in that covenant. Amen. Amen. I want to stay in that covenant. Hallelujah. I want to do what God says to do. We've got so much potential in this church, but everybody's doing their own thing. We could reach out so much more. We could do so much more. For a short time, I used to travel two hours one way to go to church. Nobody knows that. This is before I was married. I traveled two hours to go to church one way. Sister Debbie and I, one winter night, 
Bible study night. Did we take your car or my car? I think we took my car. Had Bible study in Providence, about six to eight inches of snow on the ground. Oh, we've got to cancel. I called up my pastor. I said, are you having Bible study? Well, Brother Bob, you know, he's from India. A lot of snow out there. Not too many people would come, but if you come, brother, I'll have it. I said, we'll be there. Six to eight, out, uh, six to eight inches of snow on the ground. The highway was not plowed that well either. And here comes Debbie and I. Why? Because we wanted God. What a good excuse to stay home. Oh, Pastor, isn't it dangerous? Yeah, it was. Serving God is dangerous. If you don't think so, come with me. I'll take you to some of the countries I go to. Anyone interested in going on a mission trip with me? Raise your hand. Are you? What do you mean you can't? Wait, whoa, whoa. What do you mean you can't go? Don't ever let anyone stop you. If God wants you to go, don't let anyone stop you. Not yet. You come on the mission field with me. Oh, Pastor, I can't go on the mission field. It's not. It should be, oh, Pastor, I won't go on the mission field. You can go on a mission field. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It's just you've got to line up your will to the covenant agreement that you made. He's your boss. I'll die there. No, you won't. You mean I have to go to the bathroom in a hole in the ground? Well, if that's where we are. Could be worse. Some places, they don't use paper. They use their hand. That's why it's considered unclean, your left hand. You'll never see an Indian eat with their left hand. They always tuck their left hand here, and they're always eating like this. Sometimes there's little... Gecko lizards about that big crawling on your wall in your hotel room. Remember one time there was one in the bathroom. Linda went in. Ah! 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 There's a lizard in the bathroom! But you know what? No roaches. The bugs eat the roaches. God knows what he's doing. No bugs. When you're in that blood covenant, you'll go anywhere and you'll eat anything. And my wife will do that now. So my next trip to India, you have to come. Oh, look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Big eyes like this. God's will be done. God's will be done. It's his will that you be with me. And anyone else that wants to go, Amen. Go on that mission trip. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about going on a luxury trip. There's some missionary trips that are luxury trips, you know. No. Serve. Don't be afraid. Don't let the devil. I'm going to say this. To, I don't care. This might be for somebody here. Do not let fear. And the threats of the devil stop you from what God wants to do. For God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I'm going to close right now, but I want you to stay in that covenant. Can you play that song again? This is the blood. Was that, was that what we sang? This is the blood? The last one?
Oh, this is the old one. It was the last song. Can we, can we stand and sing that song one more time in closing? Stay in the covenant. It's the blood. The blood of Jesus. I was sitting up here, you know, we had a young visitor here. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, when we sing about the blood, he's going to go. Guess what? He did. Oh, I'm in the wrong church. Yeah, you're in the wrong church. Yeah. Come on, Lisa. There is a blood. Yeah, come on, you sing. The cost of life. The pain. 